Bloody Rose, the sequel to Kings of the Wild. I had a really positive review of the first book in this series, and I can honestly say for some reason, Bloody Rose, the sequel to Kings of the Wild, was maybe a book I was like the most nervous for in a long time, purely because I didn't know how well the novelty of this concept that's executed here, such a lighthearted, humor-based, as everyone on the internet says repeatedly, D&D-feeling fantasy adventure would hold up with a sequel. And I think that would largely come down to Nicholas Ames' real technical abilities as an author, his conceptualizing a continuation of this story and executing it in a way where it's no longer just about oh, this is so much fun, this concept in itself, but it needed to transcend beyond that and become something all the more, something that could stand up on the merits the structure is built on. I'm not saying Kings of the Wild doesn't do that, but it's just even harder to do it with a sequel. And I'm aware I've been really positive on a lot of books recently. I want you to know it's not like I'm just forgetting how to be critical. I've just had like the longest hot streaks of books I've just enjoyed uh, probably my entire life recently, largely due to the recommendations you guys give. So thank you so much. I know it's fun to see me tear apart a book in an extremely negative review, but that's not going to be the case here yet again today. I do have some criticisms of Bloody Rose, but overall, I'm positive on it. I don't think I'm as positive of Kings of the Wild, because Kings of the Wild set a really high bar. I think Kings of the Wild was just something new and energetic in a way that it can just captivate any reader. Bloody Rose, I think, achieved about 75% of what Kings of the Wild did, which is impressive in its own right, because following up a book that had that large of a success is difficult. It's really difficult. The middle book syndrome, as people call it, or the sequel slog, whatever nickname you want to go by, is a real thing, because creatively as an author, it's hard to come back and follow up a story that was a hit. Your readers may not be as engaged. As I said, the novelty of whatever new you're bringing to the game might wear off. But overall, I think Nicholas Ames did a good job of continuing continuing the momentum forward he established. There is the choice here to follow a whole new set of characters while having previous characters from the last book make appearances, be involved. And that was a very smart one because if you're just here for the old crew because you love Saga and that's all you give a shit about, you'll be satisfied enough without getting into spoilers, I feel. But if you just enjoy Nicholas Ames' writing style, his character work, you're getting a whole new fresh batch, so to speak. So it kind of works out for both really well. Also, Nicholas Ames' character work is very nice, his relationship building is nice. Across the board, the guy kind of doesn't have any huge glaring flaws as an author, except for maybe a lack of taking his own story seriously enough at times, but he can still certainly land emotional gut punches as the ending of this book, again, not getting into spoilers, <laughs> most definitely did. I was nearly sobbing. I had to like, <sighs> I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that. So overall, I would say yes, I'm positive on Bloody Rose, but I do want to get into a couple criticisms I have. Uh, the first of which is that, again, as I touched on, I think Nicholas Ames would benefit a little bit, and I'm sure a lot of his fans actually disagree with me on this, so don't take this as word of God, this is my own subjective opinion, from taking his story a little more seriously at times, especially when it comes to character reactions. I'm someone who can get really bugged by a dramatic moment happening and then having a character make a joke and completely undercut the tension. I kind of in my head refer to it as the Marvel problem because Marvel does that I think now every time they have an emotional heavy moment. They can't let it rest. They have to undercut it. Except for a few obvious examples. I won't get into spoilers for Avengers Endgame in case the three people who haven't seen that are watching. It, it happened here not nearly as excessively as we see in like a Marvel movie, but a couple of times. Um, and, and I just, it's just for my own personal taste, it's starting to annoy me more and more because I'm seeing it so often now. I also was not as captivated as quickly by these characters. Fable than I was Saga in Kings of the Wild. For some reason, there is something about Kings of the Wild that will just grab you by the collar as a reader and go, you're gonna love these characters. You are going to want to be around them. They're gonna make you laugh and cry. They're perfect and magnificent. Blah. 
and it's really hard to execute something that's so smash successful again. And I don't think Nicholas Ames was quite as successful at first. I did find myself in love with this new crew by the end of it, but I would say it wasn't until about two thirds through the book that I began to feel any kind of connection with them on the emotion as I did with Saga. So there's just a little bit less of evaluation there. That's kind of where that 75% uh, compared to Kings of the Wilds, like borderline 100% comes in. Uh, but aside from that, I think if you liked Kings of the Wild, there is no reason for you to not really like Bloody Rose. It still has the humor, which reading humor is difficult. There's only very few book series who have successfully made me laugh out loud while reading them. There's fantastic representation of LGBTQ people in this, which I enjoy from Nicholas so much. It's not shoving it down your throat. No one's a caricature of what an LGBTQ plus person is. They're just people who happen to have that characteristic, which is how it should be handled. And that's really wonderful. Uh, it's cool to see that from an author who seems to be so aware of how these things should be presented. I'm going to continue to have my faith in the fantasy genre's future in terms of just diversifying its character base if I continue to see uh, characters like this from Nicholas Ames, Rebecca Kwong, and authors like that who just are bringing up the bar of how you can have inclusivity in fantasy and it just feel natural and fit. Now I hesitate to use a couple words I want to use to describe this story because a lot of people think what I'm about to say has inherent negative connotation. Please don't take what I'm about to say as a this is bad, but it's something I know would bother some people. So just keep it in mind and that, that there is corny moments in this book. I like them. I'm someone who can enjoy everything from Joe Abercrombie's the world is miserable, everything's shit, don't be happy, joy is for idiots mentality to uh, writing fantasy. And I like more of a cornball approach and I think it pays off well here, it fits the tone. But yeah, there are moments that I would say are corny. So if you are someone who just likes to revel in Prince of Thorns level just dirk, it may turn you off a bit, but I, I find Nicholas Ames work with blending heavier emotional moments, which this book has them. I think even maybe more so than Saga because they're dealing with themes of living up to what's expected to you because of family heritage. There's PTSD and drug addiction hit on quite heavily. Things I wasn't going into uh, Bloody Rose expecting, but are very prevalent. Like, these are some of the loftiest themes throughout the pages. Uh, while Saga kind of dealt with the established fame, and Kings of the Wild was just this framing of how do these old kind of rock stars as the philosophy uh, coming in you know, benefit or exist in this world as these famous people, which was really interesting to see the ideas of celebrity. That was kind of the biggest theme of Kings of the Wild. We're now seeing what's it like if the children of celebrities try to make their own, uh, you know, way in the world. Are they set to go down a similar path as their parents because they have that lore? Will they ever be able to grow past the shadow? Do they really want to? Is this life for them? All of those were so tactfully handled and it's so jarring, but it works really well to see very modern ideas and themes of celebrity woven into this inspired by rock bands, as Nicholas Ames has said, fantasy story. It's just, it's just wacky and weird. A, a side note that I think some people might enjoy, I, I recently strongly recommend Kings of the Wilds to my dad, and I told him if there was a book I have ever read that it felt like it would be written by him. It would be Kings of the Wild. This feels like a book my dad would write. Uh, <laughs> I take that however you want it. I just think it's his kind of sense of humor, his views in the world, the way he would write characters. Uh, but just ending on kind of, I, I hate to do it like checklist like this, but after Kings of the Wild, anyone who's following Nicholas Ames should expect it. Yes, the relationship and group building and dynamics there are very top tier. Uh, the world building is yes coming from a perspective of this feels like someone who really loves D, D and fantasy so if you are someone who really enjoys seeing these classic fantasy ideas recontextualized and rewritten in a modern format go right in but overall the band series is going to be one that i appreciate and enjoy due to its quirkiness i think that's one of the best adjectives you can use to describe this series so far it's dire devotion to 
weightier heartfelt moments and not having them feeling extraordinarily ham-fisted instead just really working because while there is this lighter humor throughout it uh it still has enough respect for its characters that at no point will it feel strange to have them have a very real and human moment. Kings of the Wild is kind of just going to be top tier for me, and Bloody Rose is a very acceptable, suitable, good follow-up to that. I don't think it rose the bar, but I would not go anywhere near as far as saying that it was in the sequel slump, or whatever you want to say. It holds up very well in its own merits, and I can't see anyone who enjoyed the first book not enjoying this one quite a bit as well. I'm really interested to hear from someone who read Kings of the Wild and did not like it in the comments down below, because I just want to know where you're coming from. Uh, I've seen people on Goodreads who left one-star reviews. A lot of them are just mad that there are gay characters in the story. If you're one of those people, f right off. But yeah, if you're someone who comes in from a critical perspective and said, hey, I thought this was handled very poorly and it kind of just ruined the story for me, let me know because I am totally open to your opinion and you're not wrong for having it. I just want to know where someone who has that mentality could be pulling their criticisms from because I just have a really difficult time envisioning someone sitting down and saying like, Kings of the Wild's a one out of five in terms of like the star scale Goodreads insists on having. I don't know, that's my thoughts and opinions on this one. Let me know what you thought in the comments down below. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you want to support what I do here. And have a good one, y'all. Peace. And of course, I'd like to record a special shout out to my latest high tier Patreon, who's been a Patreon, but then upgraded their pledge. Becky Harriman. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful week.